Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV original webinar series. Uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Savya Prachi Thakur. He is uh, based in uh, US. He is attached to John Hopkins University, and he is an arthroplasty surgeon. He is going to talk on kinematic alignment versus kinematic implants. And we also have our panelist with us, Dr. Gaurav Kanade. He is an assistant professor in Diva Patil Hospital and a Medical College in Nehru, Navi Mumbai. So over to Dr. Savya Sachi Thakar to start the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bijlani, for inviting me and uh, to Dr. Gaurav Kanade for moderating this session. Uh, good morning to everyone in the United States and good evening to everyone in India. I hope that you all are safe. So today I'm going to be speaking about this concept in knee replacement or knee arthroplasty called kinematic alignment, which is a little bit different than the traditional insole and Ranawath mediated um, uh, mechanical alignment. And I'm also going to compare it to the newer generation of implants that are called kinematic implants to see which one is better, an alignment philosophy change or an implant change to restore anatomic function for total knee arthroplasty patients. Uh, my disclosures, so I, am, I work at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. We have several different hospitals between Baltimore and Washington, uh, DC. And I'm also a consultant designer for Orth Align, which is a portable navigation system. So my objectives of this talk are, number one, to provide an overview of the various different alignment systems that we have available to us to align a total knee arthroplasty prosthesis today. The traditional is the mechanical alignment or sometimes also the anatomic alignment. The newer techniques are things like adjusted mechanical, kinematic, and then restricting our indications for kinematic alignment. Along with that, there has been this, uh, in, this, this invention of new implants or this introduction of new implants which are so-called kinematic implants because they are designed to restore the native kinematics of a knee. So some examples that I will be discussing today are rotating platform designs, medial pivot designs, an asymmetric design, and finally, a design which retains both the cruciate ligaments, the ACL and the PCL. So it's a bicruciate retaining design. Now, the idea of this talk is to compare alignment, to compare implants, and figure out what fits best for your practice in your hands. Because as a young arthroplasty surgeon, these debates and these challenges can be quite daunting to try and figure out the best possible path for patients. And the reason I bring this up, because unlike a total hip replacement, a total knee replacement has an 85 to 90% chance of success and about a 10 to 15% chance of failure and patient dissatisfaction with their surgery. So this is the holy grail. We don't know why some of these patients are failing and maybe it's an alignment issue or an implant issue or both. So let's explore this with the current evidence. And this is my friend, Charles Rivier, who's a French surgeon, a French trained surgeon who works now in London, United Kingdom. And he published this wonderful review on alignment options for total knee arthroplasty. And the reason we have to think about this is because there are some patients, especially a lot of patients in Europe, uh, Professor Bellemans, Johan Bellemans in Belgium came up with this concept of constitutional virus. So there are some patients, especially soccer players, athletes, runners, who have this native virus deformity. Now, if you take that patient as shown here in the left, and you make them into a neutral systematic alignment technique as shown all the way here on the right uh, of your screen, will that patient be happy or will they not be satisfied with their total knee prosthesis? So if you start with such a patient, you go all the way to the right, you see that there are two systematic alignment techniques that we have traditionally followed. The mechanical technique, which means that the implant, the axis of the implant is perpendicular to the mechanical axis, drawn from the center of the femoral head all the way down to the center of the knee to the center of the ankle. Or you could use an anatomically aligned technique with some femoral modification and put the joint line in a little bit of valgus. Then there are hybrid techniques in which you have restricted kinematic and adjusted mechanical by putting in some joint line obliquity. And finally, you have patient specific techniques 
The most obvious patient specific technique is a unicondylar knee arthroplasty because you're preserving your cruciate ligaments and your collateral ligaments and are really not supposed to perform any releases to balance the knee. So you're putting in an implant and just resurfacing the knee. Or you extend that to a total knee prosthesis and that's known as a kinematic aligned knee with joint line obliquity. So let's formalize these definitions. A mechanically aligned knee, as we discussed, is perpendicular to the mechanical axis. The anatomic aligned knee has two to three degrees of joint line valgus built into it. In an adjusted mechanical model, you are under correcting that frontal plane or coronal plane to within three degrees. And you're doing that pre predominantly by modifying the femoral cuts. In a kinematically aligned knee, it's a purely bony procedure without any soft tissue releases and you're keeping the patient where they came in. So it's a very patient specific model. And finally, some of the early adopters of the kinematic aligned knee also discuss this concept of restricted kinematic in which you're restricting your indications to perform a kinematically aligned knee to within three degrees of deformity in the frontal and the sagittal planes and within five degrees of joint line obliquities. Anything beyond that, most of us are then going to the mechanically aligned knee. I think we have a little bit of feedback. So now let's, let's compare the kinematically aligned technique to the mechanically aligned technique. So kinematic alignment, again, is a patient-specific approach. Mechanically aligned is a more systematic approach. And I'm going to highlight some of the important differences. When you're rotating the femur in your cross-sectional plane in a mechanically aligned knee, you're typically building in some external rotation compared to the posterior condylar axis, about three degrees of external rotation. Sometimes you vary that to five, seven degrees if there's a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle uh, to account for a valgus deformity. In a kinematically aligned knee, you're keeping that neutral rotation. The, the rotation is kept neutral and it's relative to the posterior cruciate ligament. So you're not building in any rotation. Secondly, in a femoral component positioning and sizing between the anterior posterior dimensions, you are only using posterior referencing technique because you're using those condyles to come up with the size. You're accounting for some wear in those condyles, but you're using them. Whereas in a mechanically aligned model, you can either go by anterior referencing, so the anterior femoral cortex, or by the posterior condyles. And we may switch depending on how much posterior condylar wear there truly is. Then in terms of the tibial rotation and the tibial cut, so the frontal tibial cut, normally we, in a mechanically aligned knee, we want to make sure that the tibial joint line is parallel to the ankle joint line, assuming there is no deformity in the tibia, in the tibial shaft. But in this case, in the kinematic case, there is no attention paid to the ankle. Those are considered to be independent and it's considered to be a part of the constitutional alignment of the patient. What about tibial sagittal positioning? In a kinematically aligned knee, you're making sure that your sagittal axis of the tibia is parallel to the medial tibial slope. So there is more attention paid to the medial tibia. With regards to the horizontal tibial positioning, you are more parallel to the lateral tibial plateau axis. So now you, your axis uh, switches in a cylindrical fashion from the medial side of the tibia to the lateral side of the tibia. With regards to femorotibial joint, in terms of soft tissue balancing in a mechanically aligned knee as uh, John Insall uh, idealized, that this is a soft tissue and a bony procedure. So once you make your bony cuts, you're also performing soft tissue releases. But in a kinematically aligned knee, you're not doing that. Your goal is to restore the constitutional knee alignment and thereby restore, restore the constitutional knee laxity without affecting the ligaments. And finally, there is also no soft tissue balancing when it comes to the extensor compartment in a kinematically aligned knee. So those are the fundamental differences between KA and MA techniques. Now, what about different implant options that are available to us today? So the first is the rotating platform. So I have an example of a fixed bearing tray in which what you would do is you would put this polyethylene into the tray and you would lock it in place. But a rotating platform allows certain rotation between the tibial polyethylene and the underlying tray. The reason this came about uh, almost 10 to 15 years ago 
was to uncouple the translational and rotational forces. And there are two ways you can do this. One is by having a central pivot. So again, going back to my example, you can see this metal bearing here, and there is a central pivot along which the polyethylene will rotate. Or secondly, more like the Biomet Zimmer Oxford Unicorn Learning, there is a meniscal bearing. So there is a mobile meniscal bearing, which allows for some uncoupling of rotational and translational forces. The second implant design is a medial pivot design. In this, the thought is that the medial articulation between the femur and the tibia is a more conforming articulation. It's more like a ball and socket joint with rolling all and, and gliding and all these forces occurring in a ball and socket fashion like a total hip arthroplasty. However, the lateral side is the less conforming design. And some of that comes from the proximal tibial uh, anatomy because in the proximal tibia, the medial side has concavity, the lateral side has relative convexity. So there is more translational and sliding forces occurring on the lateral side. So this implant is designed to preserve a medial firm ball and socket type articulation and increase translational sliding forces laterally. So a little bit of lateral laxity. The third implant design that I'm going to discuss is an asymmetric design and various companies like Smith and Nephew and Zimmer have really taken this to the next level and built in asymmetries uh, when it comes to the newer total knee arthroplasty implants. So this is an example of a Smith and Nephew journey in which there are asymmetric distal femoral cuts and correspondingly there is an asymmetric tibial polyethylene to preserve three degrees of varus at the joint line. So now you are putting everybody in three degrees of varus if you're doing a mechanically aligned knee with this type of prosthesis. But let's say you achieve kinematic alignment and you're putting them in five, seven, 10 degrees of varus at the joint line and you put in this prosthesis, all of a sudden you're building in three degrees additional varus into that because of the design of the prosthesis. So that really begs the question, should we be making our alignment cuts specific based on the patient type and the implant type, or should we keep that independent? The final design that I wanted to highlight is the bicruciate retaining design. Now, uh, almost all of us, when we do a total knee arthroplasty, we are sacrificing the ACL. Some of us preserve the PCL, some of us sacrifice the PCL, some of us build in um, some kind of uh, congruence into the polyethylene so as to minimize the function of the PCL but the ACL is uniformly sacrificed. However, there, are, there is this iteration of the design from the 1960s to the 1990s. In 60s, it was the Gunston design. In 70s, Coventry came up with the geometric design. And then in the 90s, Townley came up with his design uh, of a bicruciate retaining knee. Now, why do we care about preserving the anterior cruciate ligament? Most of us think that the proprioceptive function of a knee comes from their ACL. When the ACL is ruptured in an athlete, they suddenly lose the ability to control their knee until the quadriceps develops enough strength. So if we were to take that into a knee arthritis model, if we preserve the ACL for that patient, maybe, just maybe, the patient won't feel like they're dealing with an artificial implant. They may feel like they have their native knee. And that's why we are thinking about this type of implant. Now, when you look at these various different alignment variations, or various different implants, we need to critically assess how they do. So what are some important performance metrics? The first question we should ask is the kinematic question. Are we truly restoring the kinematics of a native knee with a knee replacement surgery? I believe the answer is no, but there is some evidence showing uh, some, some, some type of uh, um, data that people may get some kinematic benefit by performing alignment specific operations. The second thing is, can patients walk, climb stairs, perform their activities of daily living better? And most importantly, do they have a forgotten joint score that is high? So a higher forgotten joint score means that you forget that you have a total knee arthroplasty. And finally, what is the effect of the implant and bone longevity? Alignment variations, putting an implant in 10 degrees of virus, what does that do to the actual polyethylene and what does that do to the underlying bone? So these are some things we have to critically assess for the various different implants that I mentioned and the alignment types that I mentioned. 
So first off, before we think about the kinematics of a total knee replacement, let's consider for a minute from our uh, basic anatomy lessons, what is the native knee doing? What are the forces along a native knee? And as you can see, I have a knee model here. You know, most of us were taught to think that the knee is just a flexion extension device. It's more like a hinge, but now we note that there are rotational forces, there are translational forces, there are compression distraction forces. So as you can see here, there are three translational axes in a knee replacement or a, or, or a native knee, anterior, posterior, medial lateral, compression and distraction. And there are three rotational axes, flexion extension, internal and external rotation, and varus and valgus. So let's look at different knee positions and kinematics and different types of activities that we frequently do. Well, first off, in the Asian population, deep flexion is considered uh, to be absolutely paramount. So most patients are asking, can we preserve deep flexion? Well, in deep flexion, what happens is that there is more posterior translation of the lateral femur compared to the medial femur. And a net result of that is that there is external rotation of the femur and ex internal rotation of the tibia. In gait, and in gait, what is most studied is the stance phase when you're standing. There is more anterior translation of the lateral femoral and medial femoral condyles, and that's equal during flexion. And there is posterior translation during extension. So now there is a paradoxical shift compared to deep flexion. And why this happens is because of the ground reactive force. So this is Newton's third law. To every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if you're putting your foot on the ground, all of a sudden the rotation of the femur relative to the tibia changes because of the ground reactive force, unless you're floating in a swimming pool or in space. Stairs, how do we do with stairs? And in this, you know, most studies have looked at going upstairs. Very few studies have looked at going downstairs specifically for the knee. And what people have found is that there is equal translation anteriorly of the lateral femoral condyle and the medial femoral condyle. Sitting down and standing up from a, from a chair or from a car is similar to deep flexion and extension. Running, how do knees do in running? So again, low speeds have been studied. It's very hard to study someone like Usain Bolt who's running that fast because our sensors are not that precise. In running at low speeds, there seems to be an anterior translation of the medial femoral condyle compared to the lateral femoral condyle during flexion, the flexion part of running. But this is dependent on how fast people run and how much of a slope gradient they have, whether they're going uphill, level ground, or going downhill. So as you can see, this is mind boggling. The amount of complexity that a knee has is mind boggling and we have just scratched the surface. Total knee designs need to account for all these variations and account for this complexity to give you a satisfactory implant. So right off the bat, we are facing a very uphill task of designing an implant to come up with all these variations in knee kinematics. So let's look at how kinematics are restored or whether they are restored or not. So this was a Japanese study which looked at kinematics and contact forces with computer simulation. They had three models. First was a mechanically aligned total knee, then was a three degree kinematically aligned, so more of a restricted uh, kinematically aligned total knee in which the femur was in valgus and internal rotation, the tibia was also in varus and internal rotation. And finally, there was a five degree outlier. Let's say you, you cannot align it within the restricted kinematic and you have an outlier, then that's what they considered a five degree kinematic alignment outlier and they used a cruciate retaining implant. So you kept the PCL in that implant. And as you can see here, the top row is the mechanically aligned model with various degrees of flexion. And the bottom two rows are the kinematically aligned model. Red M is medial, blue L is lateral. So as you go through flexion in a mechanically aligned model, there is actually some internal rotation of the femur. In a kinematically aligned model, that seems to be matching the native kinematics of the knee in which there is more translation posteriorly of the lateral femoral condyle compared to the medial femoral condyle. So at least that seems to be restoring the native knee kinematics. However, because of the femur internal rotation and valgus, there is patellar maltracking and lateral tilt, which occurs with a kinematically aligned model, as you can see with the various degrees of flexion going down these panels. So maybe the patellofemoral joint is not doing too well. 
What about the contact stresses? Well, this group also looked at that and they found that there were greater lateral patellofemoral contact stresses early in flexion in a kinematically aligned model. So these are again, mechanically aligned, three degree kinematic and five degree kinematic. And these are contact pressures, red being the highest pressure. And you can see that there is more pressure in the kinematically aligned knee early on, and then in the mechanically aligned knee with deep flexion. What about tibial stresses? So again, you can imagine with a greater varus tilt of the tibia, and if the patient has a varus deformity, if you preserve that varus deformity, all of a sudden you're going to see more force through the medial aspect of the implant, as you can see in the kinematic model. In the mechanical aligned model, the importance is that that balance is kept intact. So there are more normal knee kinematics, but increased implant force because of this kinematic now, what about uh, the mechanical alignment? Does that have reliable patellofemoral kinematics? So this was again Charles' study that he said, you know, what if you have mechanically aligned knee? Does that mean that patients uh, and they have uh, patella resurfacing? Re Do they have anterior pain? No. So a lot of them, a mechanically aligned knee patient, will still have anterior knee pain. And patella motion, as we are realizing, is becoming complex. Uh, because it's based on trochlear geometry. A lot of different implant designs have different trochlear geometry and also on the soft tissue restraints. So I think we still have some feedback. Um, so the consideration is that should we look at distal femoral joint line obliquity or DFJLO to consider how the femoral joint performs? So Charles looked at this and what he found was, let's imagine four different patients with different kinds of joint line obliquity because of the deformity. You have valgus, six degrees, three degrees, neutral, and then three degrees of bar. Now this is going to be your distal femoral cut if you look at a mechanically aligned model. You also look at the posterior femoral cut in the mechanically aligned model, and now you realize that you Given only of three degrees of external rotation for all of these patients, there is going to be a symmetry between the posterior and distal femoral cut. So that is going to be a lot of feedback on as the distal femoral joint line obliquity valgus tends to increase, there seems to be excessive force on the lateral patellofemoral compartment. So that seems to be overstuffed, which then leads to anterior knee pain. However, if you want to customize your posterior femoral cut and your distal femoral cut based on the actual joint line obliquity, kinematically aligned principles, and then you match your posterior femoral that, you will have a matching with the distal femoral joint line of liquidity, and that will reduce the stress on the patellofemoral joint. Again, these are computational models. The real effect on patients is yet to be analyzed. Now, here is another group that looked at kinematic versus mechanical alignment, and they performed a systematic review and meta-analysis and what they found with these first plots is that you can see this diamond favors kinematic alignment on the right side, favors mechanical alignment on the left side, and zero. So if it crosses zero, which means there is no statistically significant difference. If it doesn't, then there may be a difference. So in the first part, flexion, if we can see kinematically aligned knee, seems to increase. So range of motion seems to be better. But does that translate into a functional advantage? We don't think so, because that seems to be all over the place. How about different implant options? The four different implant options that I had discussed, are they going to be better in terms of restoring kinematics? So let's look at that. First, let's look at the rotating platform. In a, in a native knee. Um, so 
in, in, a, in a liquid D, there is a lot of tibial internal rotation, okay, during deep flexion. And there is a little bit of translation. With the rotating platform design, what we are noticing is that there is only about seven degrees of rotation, not 10 to 15 degrees that normally occurs with the tibial internal rotation. But it's still better than a fixed bearing design in which you only have four or five degrees of rotation. So there seems to be some advantage in preserving the rotation with also preserving the rotation. Now, what about a rotating platform design in terms of revision? So Ritter's group looked at this in Indiana, and what they found was that a rotating platform design results in 40% less micro motion at the implant cement interface. And hopefully that results in better kinematics and better survival of revision implants. And I think, again, the data is relatively new, but at least there is a theoretical benefit to this principle. How about using a cruciate retaining versus a posterior stabilized design? There seems to be no difference when it comes to kinematics. They seem to be equally preserved if you're using a rotating platform design, CR or PS, with stair climbing. So there is some functional advantage to that kind of design. Look at the medial pivot. So the medial pivot, again, medially, it's tight. Laterally, it is loose. That's what the native knee feels like. And Menegi's group in Indiana looked at this using a cruciate retaining and a cruciate substituting design and found that both of them behave like a medial pivot, essentially, if you do not balance the joint. So medial pivot, they found by itself, may be too simple. What seems to be happening in knees which have an intact ACL is that early on, there is lateral pivoting. And later on, there is medial pivoting. So it's called the LLM, early lateral late medial pivoting. It's a dual pivot mechanism to a knee, which seems to be the most favorable. The opposite, which is early medial pivoting and late lateral pivoting seems to be the least favorable. So using these, this concept, what he said is, I'm going to use a CR and a CS polyethylene in a single radius implant design. Um, and I'm not going to worry about the status of the PCL. And I'm going to put this in with the smart tibial trays. It's called ortho sensor in which you can assess the pressure. And we're going to see how the pivoting is going to behave. What he found was very humbling that in a minority of patients, you could get the early lateral, late medial pivot. In most patients, you got other kinematic patterns. So that seems to be very difficult to predict if you're going to put in a medial pivot knee, how it may end up behaving. What about gait? How do people perform? So Professor Haddad uh, in England look at, looked at this and he performed a gait analysis comparing single radius cruciate uh, substituting or sacrificing designs with a medial pivot implant and found absolutely no difference in various different gait parameters. So in terms of gait and in terms of function, designs like a medial pivot are not seemingly of offering any kind of functional benefit to patients. Now let's look at asymmetric designs in which you can have either distal femoral cut asymmetry, uh, proximal tibial uh, implant asymmetry or both. And in this, this group in Italy compared a symmetric versus an asymmetric design in mobile bearing total knees. And they looked at stresses, compressive stresses, shear stresses, and material stresses. And what they found was that asymmetric designs overall in green leads to lower stresses in things like gait and in squat. They are not necessarily statistically significant, but overall seems like they're offering favorable stress transfer to the tibia, which is what we care about. How about the bicruciate retaining design? So in a bicruciate retaining design, um, it's important to see how that compares to the native knee. So if you get it on one side, does it feel like the knee on the other side? So this group uh, in Korea compared, or South Korea compared a native knee to a cruciate retaining knee, which is keeping your PCL, then they compared it to a standard bicruciate retaining knee and then a patient specific bicruciate retaining knee. So this is a customized bicruciate retaining knee and how do they perform? So these are the, the images from that paper. And what they looked at was gait and deep knee bend. So in gait, what seems to happen is that there are similar kinematics between the native knee and a patient specific bicruciate retaining knee. 
So you cannot just take a standard off the shelf my cruciate retaining knee and hope that it functions like the native knee. No, you have to make it very specific to the patient's native anatomy. How about deep knee bends? Again, there seems to be similarity between the native knee and a patient specific by cruciate retaining knee and not a standard implant. So if you're going to do a by cruciate retaining knee, now you have to invest in getting a patient specific model made from imaging, most likely a CT scan, and then send it to the company and have customized patient specific jigs to implant this prosthesis. Another group in Japan looked at high flexion activities, again, important for the Asian population. And what they found interestingly was that in a bicruciate retaining knee, we were able to get, or they were able to get medial pivot, which is the early lateral late medial pivot type of dual pivot mechanism, which seems to be so favorable. And that makes sense. If you're going to preserve your ACL, you should at least get the functional benefits of that ACL. Now, what they also took this to the next level and they said, how about we take a bicruciate retaining design and we add medial constraint into it like a medial pivot design. Is that going to make the kinematics better? And lo and behold, they found that. So preserve your ACL, preserve your PCL, and then add some medial conformity to your implant. And all of a sudden you have a bicruciate retaining prosthesis that functions a lot like your total or like your native knee. Now, what about laxity? You know, the, the biggest problem with a bicruciate retaining design is post-operative stiffness uh, because we still don't understand what happens to the ACL and the PCL in arthritis. Do they become stiff? Do they become loose? What happens to the other ligaments? We, we know that some of the other ligaments become tight. So what about laxity in bicruciate retaining, to, retaining total knees? So this is a study from Belgium in which there was a cadaveric model in which they looked at varus valgus laxity with flexion and compression distraction laxity also with flexion. And what they found, the blue bar, the blue line is the native uh, knee and the diamond is the bicruciate retaining knee. So the bicruciate retaining knee in various degrees of flexion, both in terms of varus valgus laxity and compression dis uh, distraction, seems to be the closest to the native knee. So there is some similarity between these two models. The other models, which is the cruciate retaining and the bicruciate substituting knees seem to be completely different and completely um, uh, you know, unreliable when it comes to how they perform compared to the native knee. Now, the, the important question or the most important question is, does a unilateral total knee or a unilateral bicruciate retaining knee behave like the contralateral nat native knee? Is there a similarity or is there a difference? So the verdict is with the various degrees of rotation and translation, these black bars indicate differences between the red lines, which are bicruciate retaining and the green line, which are native knees. The black bars are pretty big, except for superior femoral translation. In all other cases, a native knee and a bicruciate retaining total knee behave quite differently. So they're not exactly the same and patients may still end up feeling a difference. The early lateral late medial pattern, the dual pivot pattern is only visible in about 50 to 60% of patients in a bicruciate retaining total knee arthroplasty, not in other patients. So again, there is a limitation to this design this implant design that we still do not understand. Now, what about muscle activation? So if you preserve your ACL and if it truly gives you the proprioceptive advantage, the thought is that you should be then recruiting less muscles, less of your quadriceps, less of your hamstrings to stabilize the knee because you have an intrinsic stabilizer in the knee. So what about muscle firing patterns when you are walking in using a cruciate retaining design versus a bicruciate retaining design. The thought is that a bicruciate retaining design should activate fewer muscle groups. And that seems to be the case. However, not in level walking. In level walking, the muscle firing was the same, whether you use a cruciate retaining or a bicruciate retaining design. But downhill walking recruited less muscles across the board when it comes to your vastus medialis, uh, your rectus, your biceps, uh, or your semitendinosus across the spectrum, they were uh, activated less for a bicruciate retaining knee walking downhill. So this may be important for people living in mountainous areas. 
And when you look at that, you know, the traditional patient in the United States may want to get out of their car, may want to run, may want to go to the local fast food or grocery store, but it's more level walking. But if you look at patients, maybe in Himachal Pradesh or Switzerland, they have to do a lot of mountainous going up and downhill. And in them, there may be a functional benefit to using a bike cruciate retaining knee. So that brings us to the million dollar question or the million rupee question. Is natural kinematics equal to good function? Can you restore function by restoring the kinematics? Or is there a gap in that? So Professor Howell uh, in the United States looked at his outcomes. And what he did is that he looked at his kinematically aligned knees, which were in the normal range that he had predicted. Varus outliers, so people put in too much of varus, and valgus outliers, people put in too much of valgus. And he looked at their function, various different functional scores, such as the Oxford score, Womack score, et cetera, at 38 months and found absolutely no difference in their functional outcome. So there seems to be a disconnect between their alignment and their function. Also, he extrapolated this data and looked at his tenure um, outcomes, whether they were in the range, virus outliers, valgus outliers, and again, found absolutely no difference. There is no statistically significant difference. So that makes us think, how do we align these knees and whether or not they're going to have any functional benefit? Yes, sure, you can say that their function is good, but their function is also good with a mechanically aligned knee. So why should I be changing to kinematic alignment? This is a paper from South Korea, which again found absolutely no difference in function between kinematic and mechanically aligned knees with various different functional scores. And finally, this is um, meta-analysis and a systematic review, again, looking at those forest plots, there is some benefit in doing kinematically aligned knees when it comes to functional scores. People seem to have higher functional scores and range of motion for some of those scores. In the other scores, like a WOMAC score, Oxford knee score, a knee society score, that diamond seems to cross zero, which means there is no statistically significant difference between mechanically and kinematically aligned knees. So there may not be a true functional benefit. Now, this was an award-winning study from New Zealand that was presented at the Knee Society in 2016, in which they looked at kinematically aligned knees versus mechanically aligned knees and found you know, various different functional scores. They looked at various different functional scores and found absolutely no benefit at two years. Absolutely no difference whether you did a good kinematically aligned knee or a good mechanically aligned knee. So absolutely no functional benefit. And the forgotten joint score was also the same. The Exeter group shows the same thing. There is no functional benefit when you look at all these various scores, European scores, uh, time up and go, uh, two minute distance test, absolutely no difference uh, whether you do a planned kinematic or a planned mechanical. Now, if you extend this and let's say that you're, you don't follow your plan, you all start you have an incorrect piece in the functional scores. So there is some disconnect between putting a knee where you think it is and then achieving the function that you want for that patient. And that's what we are most interested in. How about a rotating platform design? Does that lead to good function? So these are studies which looked at a cementless rotating platform design and a cemented rotating platform design and found that they are equal. They found that overall patients seem to do pretty good. And if you look at the functional scores, uh, the numbers, the raw numbers, they are similar to a kinematically aligned group. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but with the rotating platform designs, there is still grinding, there is still popping, there is still clicking. So patients still feel like they have a mechanical implant. They don't feel like it's natural. It's not how a native knee behaves. So there is still a limitation and patients still report, report uh, there is trouble getting out of a chair. There is trouble um, you know, with some of these mechanical symptoms in a knee replacement. Now, what about medial pivot designs? In medial pivot designs, uh, as shown here in this graph, um, patients have said that most of them have felt that their knee felt to be normal. Uh, the other designs, so the non-medial pivot designs, fewer percentage of patients felt their knee to be normal. So there may be some benefit in having that medial constraint. However, when you look at the various different functional scores again in that, the feeling of a knee being normal does not make somebody more or less functional. 
I think that that is a higher level of understanding that we don't yet have about how a knee functions. A dual pivot pattern, again, seems to be very similar to the kinematics of a native knee, but functionally, there is no difference once again in the score. So that is frustrating for all of us that either do these studies, do these, uh, uh, do these surgeries, or look at the literature, because if you don't have a functional benefit, why should you change what you are doing? Now, here are some other papers in, in Toronto, in Canada, which looked at this uh, Backstein's group. And they said that, you know, there was a slight favor towards a medial pivot design. Some patients seem to like it better for some of the th activities that they were doing. With regards to asymmetric designs and asymmetric inserts, there is only one study out there if you read the literature. And the function seems to be equal when it comes to symmetric versus asymmetric inserts. So again, no functional benefit. And when you, when you extrapolate this data to bicruciate retaining designs, again, there seems to be a similar joint awareness. So, uh, you know, whether patients notice that they have a bicruciate retaining or a cruciate retaining really doesn't seem to alter. What seems to be important for a bicruciate retaining design is your posterior slope. If you make a mistake and put in too much posterior slope for these patients, that seems to load their ACL a lot more and can result in ACL rupture, which then leads to a poor functional outcome for these patients. So it's critical to pay importance to their design. Now, what about um, a custom bicruciate retaining design? So this is a paper by Professor Beckman's group in Stuttgart in, in Germany. And what they found is that they have pretty good outcomes with a custom patient-specific bicruciate retaining design. And they seem to have pretty good functional scores as well. The functional scores are also related to the forgotten joint score. So this is another paper out of Germany in which they looked at joint, forgotten joint score. If you have a higher forgotten joint score, that means that you have forgotten you have a prosthesis. So they compared a bicruciate retaining design to a standard posterior stabilized total knee to a unicondylar total or a unicondylar knee arthroplasty, a partial knee replacement. And what they found was that a bicruciate retaining knee and a uni seemed to have similar forgotten joint scores, but a posterior stabilized total knee seemed to have lower forgotten joint scores. So there may be some benefit in forgetting that you have a total knee replacement if you use some of the newer designs or if you apply kinematic principles such as a uni. And there is a thought, uh, Professor Justin Cobb in the United Kingdom, he picks doing a medial uni, then a patellofemoral, and then a lateral uni over doing a total knee replacement. So there may be some thought in preserving the native architecture of the knee and just resurfacing the arthritic surfaces instead of replacing the entire knee. Now, this was a, a systematic review that we performed on bicruciate retaining knees. And what we found was that overall, the kinematics are similar to the native knee. There is superior proprioception from that ACL uh, compared to various different other types of total knee, but it is technically challenging. It's unreliable on how we perform these procedures and functionally you're no superior than a cruciate retaining total knee. So maybe it is a difficult surgery, but not necessarily validated in terms of functional outcomes. The final aspect that we have to assess is only how does the underlying bone perform? Are we creating revisions for us down the road by either switching our implant designs or switching the way we align them? So let's look at kinematic alignment survival. At short-term follow-up, people have looked at this, there is excellent survival. There is almost 98% implant survivorship. Extending it a little bit further, um, you know, different groups have shown that again, it's 97 to 98% survival shift in the short term. Now, what about long term or medium term survival shift? So this is uh, Dr. Howell's group, once again, who has the most data in this. And what they found is that at five years to 10 years, there is really 98% survival shift. When you look at revision for aseptic loosening, if you malalign this, if you put this in too much varus, is it going to loosen over time? Really, the revision rates are not existent. They're only one or 2%, which is comparable to a standard mechanically aligned knee. So patients seem to be doing really, really well when it comes to these implants. 
What about short-term functional outcomes? Is there any difference? So this was again a um, systematic review and a meta-analysis, and there was really no functional uh, or survival benefit to performing one versus the other design. So in the short term, both alignment designs seem to be just fine. This was the same study, the Knee Society uh, award-winning study from New Zealand, which also found absolutely no difference in survival rates and revision percentages for kinematic versus mechanical. So at least we can say that a kinematically aligned knee is not performing any less than a mechanically aligned knee. So at least there is no inferiority. There may not be superiority either. What about rotating platform designs? In this group, whether you use a cementless design or a cemented design at 10 to 20 years, there seems to be excellent survival. So rotating platforms are tried and tested and you can use this. You may not have that much of a kinematic or functional benefit, but at least you can use them with excellent survival. With regards to medial pivot, these designs have only been around for 12 to 15 years or studied for 12 to 15 years. And again, there is excellent survival at that time frame. In asymmetric designs, a lot of implant companies have introduced this. There are newer studies coming out. There are really no medium or long-term survival studies. So we have to be a little bit cautious whether or not preserving that three degrees of joint line varus makes any difference. And if you think about it, let's say you have a patient in 10 degrees of valgus and all of a sudden you do a mechanically aligned knee and put them in three degrees of varus with this type of implant, are they going to be happy or not? Finally, with regards to bicruciate retaining survival, in the short term, people have said that there is very good survival, almost 98% at two or three years, and patella revision seem to be the most common because the extensor mechanism seems to be stressed if that ACL is not functioning like it should. Higher reoperation rates do exist with bicruciate retaining, probably because of technical challenges associated with preserving both cruciate ligaments. However, some studies are more humbling with an 88% survival, so almost a 12% failure rate at three years. And that's a pretty high failure rate with a newer implant design. Tibial loosening seemed to be the most common issue for revision in some of these bicruciate retaining designs. So again, making sense because it's technically a more demanding procedure for those patients. So in conclusion, what I want to state is that native knee kinematics are very complex. And if you try and use a total knee replacement and try and restore these kinematics, it is even more challenging. And I don't think that we have an answer yet. Kinematics are not correlating with outcomes necessarily. And just like the previous generation, there were debates whether or not to resurface the patella, whether to use CR designs or PS designs. We don't have a consensus on any of those debates. I think that the debate of this generation is going to be kinematically aligned or mechanically aligned. There is no clear cut winner. They are equally losing uh, in this race against finding why 15% of patients are not happy with their total knee replacements. And I think because we don't understand the complete function of the knee, we are unable to reproduce it with a total knee arthroplasty. And again, also in terms of implant designs, there is no clear winner. As long as you use a good tried and tested implant and you apply it with your surgical technique, paying attention to how you apply that implant, I think that you will have a winning combination. So I'll show you my personal bias. You know, I get a lot of these deformity cases, which obviously in India, uh, in other Asian countries and developing countries, we tend to see uh, patients who've neglected this for a very long time. So I will either use a large console or a small console navigation and aim for a neutral mechanical axis because such a deformity, if I try and preserve the kinematics, we have already seen that the native anatomy has failed. So the kinematic alignment will likely fail as well. And I am yet to see papers looking at kinematic alignment in such type of deformities and addressing the deformity and the patient function. So I am. these are the two year follow-up x-rays for this patient. And as you can see, I've, I've restored the native, the, the neutral mechanical axis. And there are pretty large polyethylene components because of the soft tissue releases that we have to perform to align patients um, into their mechanical kind of framework. Um, and this is the lateral X-ray at two years. The implant has survived. I have used uncemented tibial stems for this patient. 
because of the increased forces that the patient will see as you release the ligaments um, and you know the release the, the ligaments may tend to go back to their native position so we want to protect against that aseptic loosening risk and this is a video of the patient uh, just before her surgery as you can see here holding on to the edge of the stretcher not being able to walk not being able to cook not being able to do anything for herself or her family and these this is the video of her walking at two years postoperatively. Now you can, of course, argue that she has a stiff gait because of a mechanically aligned knee, but at least she's able to walk unassisted, able to stand, able to perform the functions, her activities of daily living with a good amount of satisfaction. It may not be 100%, but it's close to that. So with that, any questions that you may have? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savya Sachi Thakar. Uh, this topic is a little... Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Mm, I can't hear you. Gaurav, can you put on your video? Dr. Shiv Kumar, no. can you put on your video? Yes. yes. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, now I can hear you. Yes. So uh, we also, I would like to introduce Dr. Shivkumar Santpure. Most of his practice is an arthroplasty Hello. practice. He is uh, uh, he's, uh, he's operating from Aurangabad. He has his own hospital. And he's one of the dynamic guys who does arthroplasty for everyone since the beginning of the practice. But uh, now we have come to know about him in the last five years that uh, he's one of the arthroplasty guys in that area. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Dr. Shivkumar, do you want to start? Yes, sir. Can you ask some questions to him regarding the topic? So, uh, what is his uh, uh, current choice of implant in a in a moderately deformed knee? After hearing uh, about the the implant, almost every implant is doing the same. So, what is his current personal choice in a moderately deformed knee? So that's a fantastic question. Thank you very much for asking that. You know, I uh, am a believer still in the mechanically aligned model or restricted kinematic. And I will use, uh, you know, if I had to name a company, it would be a Depew uh, Attune um, with uh, the possibility of increasing my constraint. So sometimes the Attune, you know, is uh, only limited to CR and uh, PS. Now the revision Attunes are coming with increased level of constraint. So sometimes in those cases, I will use a Depew Sigma uh, or like a Zimmer CCK, which offers me various different levels of constraint. And I'll start with the lowest level, which for me is a PS, and then build up from there. So you're not a CR. Uh, you would sacrifice the cruciate. I agree. Because, yeah, you know, because um, I don't, the, the, the biggest issue that I have found is I don't know what the cruciate tension should be number one. Yes. Um, and it's difficult to balance that. And if it's an arthritic knee, then what, what happens with that? So, you know, in, in my training, I kind of learned that if you are a CR person, nothing wrong with it, but you may have to deal with some cases of post-operative stiffness. And if you're a PS person, you may have to deal with some cases of post-operative instability. So you have not shifted yourself to kinematic alignment yet, not as I understand. Not completely. I, I am of the belief that I want to restore kinematics with the implant. So if I'm going to see somebody in a virus deformity, you know, five to 10 degrees, I may perform slight releases uh, on them. I may use the asymmetric implants like a Smith & Nephew Journey or a Zimmer persona and preserve some activity in the water. Okay. Now, one thing that has helped me is that for every knee replacement patient now, uh, or for every, every patient uh, that has a hip or knee problem, I'm getting long length images all the way from the pelvis to the ankle. And that has tremendously reduced how many releases I perform. Because if you just look at a 
magnified X-ray of a knee, sometimes we tend to think that, wow, this is a lot more varus or this is a lot more valgus. And all of a sudden, we are tempted to release a lot more. So now I'm being very, uh, very conservative with how much ligament relief we have to do. Have you ever done the kinematic alignment in the valgus knee? Yes. Do you perform or is totally? In those cases, I still believe in performing a mechanically aligned knee. I have not done it in a valgus knee. Um, and I haven't really seen much literature focused on that, quite honestly. So for the kinematic knee, how do you take the femoral cut? Yes. Is a perpendicular TBL cut or how do you, you perform first femoral cut or then TBL cut or how do you go ahead for the kinematic? Yeah, so there are different, uh, you know, devices that uh, come. So, you know, you can, you can look at long length x-rays and aim to restore their distal femoral joint line obliquity. You calculate that out based off your mechanical axis and you can adjust your... Uh, if you use uh, some of Dr. Howell's jigs, what... Um, they are based off is the amount of wear. So the, the jig is set based on whether there is medial sided wear or lateral sided wear. And they have shims that come onto that, which you literally place on the bone. And then you put your pins in and make your distal femoral cut based off that. You can also use navigation based on your preoperative planning and say that this is where I want to cut it and make sure that you align your navigation system uh, to that. So there are various different ways of making a cut. Um, you can also base it off the tibia, but frequently, you know, um, we are cutting the femur first. So I'm not relying on the tibia um, to base my restricted kinematically aligned knees. I'm cutting the femur first. Soft tissue releases in, in case of kinematic. Yeah, so what about soft tissue releases? You know, when I, when I you know, did cases with Charles Rivier, it's, it's interesting, you still end up releasing the deep fibers of the MCL on the tibia to get your medial exposure, to make your cuts. So I think that that tends to happen. Uh, but then the rest of the soft tissue releasing in a pure kinematic model, they're not doing it. Um, some of us who are the restricted kinematic folks, we will do a little bit of pie crusting. So I think that we still are accounting for some type of uh, contraction and releasing that. I was just going through some literature. There is inverse kinematic allergy. Do you have any idea about it? I don't. No, no, I don't. No. Basically, in that, they said that they resect the medial and uh, resection of the medial and lateral tibial condyle is the same, means identical to maintain the joint line obliquity. Then the medial distal femoral resection has to be equal to the thickness of the femoral implant. And tibial slope is parallel to the medial slope of the medial tibia. And obviously, there is no soft tissue release. Just slight different from the kinematic uh, So, what I understand from your talk is that kinematic alignment is still uh, no, catching up. It has not fully caught up. And uh, for routine knee replacements, which with, uh, as uh, Dr. Shivkumar Sanpure asked, with routine mild moderate deformity, uh, the basic implant like an attune without uh, should be good enough without using the kinematic alignment with the basic navigation. Am I understanding right? Absolutely. Because, you know, I think that there are a lot of us out there. You know, the, the, there is a balance between uh, implant. I have the latest, latest technique. But we forget that for that to really be applicable, there has to be a functional benefit. I and a lot of people world over are not finding that much of a functional benefit just yet in the literature. Maybe it's because we are not sensitive enough to detect this, this difference. So we just have to be cautious. Uh, and I agree with you. I think that as long as you follow sound techniques, whether you do pure kinematic, restricted or mechanical, and you have an implant with a good track record in your hands, 
you will end up with 85 to 90 percent success and we are still working hard to figure out the last 10 to 15 percent of success uh, go ahead go ahead so how do you basically kind of simplify when we, when we should go for the kinematic knee for this knee and we should when we go for the mechanical element for the other knee yeah so for for me the cutoff is um, you know, five to seven degrees of joint line obliquity. If there is more than that, I'm going mechanical, whether it's varus or valgus. Uh, and then if it's varus, I am performing some microsting and then using a constitutional knee. I will then perform some microsting posterior laterally um, and around the IT band. And then I will put in a, 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 a standard implant, like a symmetric implant. If they are more than five to seven degrees of varus or valgus, um, you know, I just can't give you that. If they are less than that, then I'm doing restricted kinematic alignment with a, a standard, not with a uh, modern uh, implant. I don't know what that will do to their alignment. You said something about a medial to pivot joint. Medial pivot joint. So those medial pivot joints and cruciate, bicruciate retaining implants are, I think, still not available in India. Yeah. Can you just briefly explain about the medial uh, pivot joint? When do you use it? Routine virus cases you use it or some severe cases? Wherein... Yeah, so, so uh, you know, that's a great question. So I think that some severe cases where I'm doing a mechanical alignment and I want to reduce the level of constraint that I am applying to the implant by not going up uh, you know, in terms of uh, PS to CCK, then I'm giving them medial stability with that medial pivot implant uh, because it is more like a ball and socket joint medially. You know, it's a lot of conformity medially, so it's stable there. And laterally, there are some sliding forces, but as long as you balance out the medial side of the knee, you will have a stable knee which will not dislocate or subluxate. Basically, it's like constraint on the medial side. Exactly right. But and less constraint of the lateral. Do you need, need to put in the rod in the TBR to stabilize it or not required? No, you don't need to you don't need to put in a stem in the TBR to stabilize it. Correct. No. You know, a lot of these implants, uh, newer generation implants are obviously more expensive and technically more demanding. So I think that their uptake has not uh, happened uh, in many places. Uh, and, you know, even the Smith & Nephew microchip retaining implant, which is probably the most uh, common one now, it is going out of favor. Uh, because I think for the arthroplasty surgeon, um, it may be easier to do a medial uni, a lateral uni, and then a patellofemoral. Uh, whether you do it in one setting or multiple different settings, if it if it needs, uh, then to perform this bike route retaining, that seems to be more challenging. Neeraj, I think you're muted. Mic is muted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Savya Sachi. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav Kanade, and thank you, Dr. Shiv Kumar Sanpure. And we thank uh, Ortho TV and we thank GSK consumers, the makers of Iodex Gel, to bring us this webinar. Thank you very much, and good night to everyone, and good day to you, Savasachi. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.